curtain. Ignore it, man. Do you need the power? Or? It's unplugged in. All right. Just like Chuck to find out how to take up more of the time behind the podium there. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Any other questions while he's hooking up? Yeah, Google. Um, yeah, we actually use Google Earth for uh, one of our university clients, and that's the way they wanted to deliver the product. Um, but within the last month, Google has shut down their 3D library. It no longer exists. So they, they sold it to Trimble, actually. They sold it to <laughs> Trimble, but there's, there's no... All the work I put into that, I can't see it now. It's gone. Um, thus, I need to go somewhere else to show that information. So I, I'm not sure what the future holds for Google and Google Earth. I've heard many different stories, but I don't have a specific one from Google tell me what they're going to do. But I was very disappointed. Uh, we had like a, a one-month notice that they were no longer going to support it. So we have 60-something models of the campus, and they're all gone now. Off of Google Earth, at least. We still have them. But we're going to do what I wanted to do from the beginning, which is put it in City Engine is where I want it to reside. And that's, that's where we'll re-deliver it uh, as well. So be careful with Google right now. I'm not sure. Can you just paint a little bit on that? So they had SketchUp, and that's what they sold to Trimble. Correct. The Google Warehouse. Yeah, Google yeah. Warehouse, yep. Yeah. And they, they shuttered Google Warehouse. I didn't know that. Yeah. And was, was there a term submitted, like license agreement, in terms of what was up on the cloud? If you've ever posted to the Google Warehouse, you're basically you're allowing Google to take, they'll verify your model under their terms, but then it's it's out for, it's like Wikipedia, it's out there. So um, it sounds like it was more like their property. Then. So it is their property. And, and that's, one thing to be aware of with all of this stuff, you, you are at the mercy at times. That's why I like the fact that I have a Unity solution. I have an Esri solution. I'm not trapped. I still have a deliverable. But will Esri be around in five years? Will they be sold to Trimble or who knows? You know what I mean? I don't know if you're ever going to get past that. <laughs> <laughs> or how about this? Will Google buy Esri? <laughs> I think if you, or maybe Autodesk. <laughs> I think if you use a free resource, you always got to expect it's going to get it's going to get costly. Because even, even Microsoft Esri had that deal with Microsoft, and all of a sudden Microsoft kind of pulled back on it. So I think anytime you're using something for free, always anticipate that you're going to end up paying for it. Now, now Google Earth and Google do they are pushing the rebirth of Google Earth. They're actually uh, taking lidar data down to one meter resolution of. So far, if you go see Philadelphia, Las Vegas, or Boston, or a couple other major cities, they've actually um, done them completely to one meter resolution um, of those cities. And they've applied their aerial imagery to those models. Um, the first blush to me is a step backwards. The models don't look near as nice. But the fidelity of the terrain is much, much better. And now you're getting things like light poles and signs. They're all showing up in Google Earth right now. I think the reason why they shut the warehouse down is they wanted the data integrity of their models, not, again, of whatever you created or whatever you created. They want it to be theirs. So, so my guess is at some juncture, they'll re-release it somehow. You can't post to the Google Warehouse anymore. It, it, it was shut down on uh, September 1st. You know what they plan to do? I mean, the, all, the, all the stuff that's there is still there. None of my model. They're all gone. They're all gone already. Uh, the, the only trick I've seen so far with, with Google Earth is they do have a time slider on the bottom. And if you slide back in time, say you go from today back to 2005, 
the old Google Earth will activate and those old warehouse models will show up for now, for, for this week. Um, so, not sure. I, I don't know what they're going to do. I really don't. Yeah? You know, I, I, I'm in the mobile mapping industry and stuff. I would probably say what's pushing Google most right now is, is a mad competition between Nokia, Google, and Apple. Mm. If you look at Apple Maps, the last version of Apple Maps is pretty incredible. What hurts the companies that have been in it a long time is Apple created an engine that was very efficient because they were doing it from scratch. Unless Google replaces Google Earth, they cannot compete on the same level. They got a huge high-density database, mm -hmm. which Nokia has too, but if you use the, the Nokia maps or here, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's, it's bulky and hard to move around it. That's one of the advantages Apple has right now. That's going to be a battle that we're going to see ensuing for the next next few years because the places they're all trying to get into is the dashboard of your cars and into your phones and stuff. So it's going to be a mad rush. We'll all have a lot of fun watching it. But, uh, be careful if you get too close because I had an Earthline system I bought a year ago. Two months later, Earthline got bought out by Nokia. Nokia came back to me and said, we're not giving you any more systems and all the data you collect is going to be Nokia owned. Well, I work for state DOT and stuff. I can't. I can't do that. That's not a model I can do. So luckily, they bought my system back from me. But you know, if you get too close to it, you're gonna get burned. It's it's a very fast-paced uh, market. There's a lot of money at stake. A lot of money at stake. The Apple models look great. Just don't try to search on them. <laughs> yeah, well, their data. They still need to get better data. That's for sure. All right. Well, I threw these slides in. It's been mentioned quite a bit, the whole notion of civil integrated management, the Everyday Counts initiative. I just thought I should put the slides in in case they weren't talked about. But uh, this morning, several people mentioned it. Potentials for funding specifically um, identified a couple of different innovations specifically identified were GIS, um, collaboration, and 3D modeling. 3D engineered models is what uh, FHWA is calling them. Um, we haven't actually seen a, an example, at least we haven't, of funding on a project, but that's the notion is that there will be funding available for projects that um, are using these uh, innovative tools. So I'm going to talk a little bit and go back in time a little more. Um, some of the typical uses we find for our, our city models, um, probably the most important is just large-scale projects are better visualized in context. So for some of our projects, we Part of our contract is to build the context around it. And as you have projects overlap, pretty soon the, the models get larger and larger. We actually have worked with some cities to visualize the changes to the city with large scale projects um, and with development changes. Um, another is just informational. It's much easier to locate where you are in a project when you're looking at a model of the region that the project sits in. Um, and now Chuck showed a few things. We're seeing more and more analytical uses for these city models. We do a lot of shadow studies with our models as long as we can get accurate enough data. Um, wind, CFD, we're starting to see more of those types of analyses. And then Chuck showed some great examples of using the model as your portal to other types of data. Um, so for New York, I'll show sort of a, an example of the two extremes. We've, we've pretty much built the entire New York area for several projects. And one of the introductions to almost every project is an animation kind of flying around showing where that project is. This was a, an animation that was done for a presentation on LaGuardia Airport, sort of showing that approach. If you've ever been on the left side of an aircraft, you get this great panorama of uh, New York as you come in. And then, of course, showing the, the, the plane landing. But these models, if they're built detail, uh, in, with enough detail, as I said, you can do some other types of analysis. In New York, we do a lot of shadow studies in Midtown. We acquired some GIS data from the city, incorporated that into both our VIS model, plus a, a, a more simplified model that's used primarily for doing these kind of shadow studies. And one of the studies we're doing right now is uh, specific open spaces and building plazas in the city. So this looks very dark, but you'll notice there are a few places where there are some bright spots. So we set the analysis up to mask out uh, everything but these specific locations where we were looking at uh, uh, sunlight studies and then ran these shadow maps for specific times of the year based on the city's uh, requirements for, whoops, 
for shadow studies. Uh, another rule they have is protecting historic buildings. So we had something like uh, 16 buildings in this area that we had to show specific impacts from new development that was being proposed. So you'll see regular sunlight on the buildings and then at one point a, uh, a yellow shadow comes in which is a shadow from a proposed volume, a new building. And if anybody's done shadow studies, the one big challenge is you have to have enough of the surrounding context to uh, accommodate buildings that could be a mile away at certain times of year. So this became a very large, um, uh, monstrous model to deal with. One of the first cities that we really started uh, engaging to approach this idea of a digital city model was Seattle. We started way back in the, um, I think, 2002 when the Alaska Way Viaduct project was first starting to loom. And the city provided us their geospatial data set. We went through some hurdles to try to get most of the city built as simple 3D model um, volumes. But then in 3D Studio Max, in this case, we took certain areas, hero buildings we called them, along the corridor and started modeling those at a higher level of detail. Um, at one point, we were doing this partly on spec, knowing that there would be a long-term investment in having the city uh, and in some cases where there were impacts or project um, decisions being made in specific locations, we would model out detail in those locations. Obviously, the waterfront was a, a very important part of this model because the, the corridor goes right along the waterfront in Seattle. Uh, as I said, the Alaska Way Viaduct was the primary uh, project that started most of this city modeling. And we did lots of different, anim different animations showing different alternatives and how the project sat in the city, what views from the project would be of the city, both with a tunnel option and with an elevated option. It was really the first, um, the first time we had been able to invest so much time in a, in a model like this. So there's just flying over the tunnel and showing where the tunnel is relative to development on the surface. And this was in the, you know, the early part of the 2000s, of 2000s um, there was still a lot of development happening in Chicago. And so whenever a new development would be proposed, and if it was in an area that was in a detailed part of our model, the city asked us and suggested to the developers that they should use this model as a tool to show the impacts to the skyline of their development, but also you know, if, they, if they wanted to, to use it to show you know, what their project was going to be like. So this was done for the developer of the, the shiny building in the middle. And not only were we doing flyovers showing you know, where the building was going to be, what it was going to look like, we could also do views from inside the building showing potentially what um, different floor views would be uh, of other buildings around and out to the water. So this would be a typical office or conference room on a certain floor in the building and all the buildings around it were done pretty accurately, so you had relatively good views. Of course, all the landscape around it and uh, the open spaces are the classic modeling technique that Chuck mentioned. We usually get USGS uh, terrain data or city terrain data, and we get aerial photos and keep those updated, and that's the base for most of our models. This was just a fun animation. This is something we did for the city uh, going backwards in time, it's kind of a reverse 4D model, if you will. Um, they asked us to show what the city development would look like from the 60s to the present. And since most of the newer buildings were in our model in 3D, it was really relatively e easy for us to take a photograph from, I guess it was 1958, and then using our model, we rendered buildings over time coming in on the skyline. So it was kind of a nice way to see uh, development over time. We're now working with them to potentially try to build a 4D model of city development, something that's kind of unique and, and as far as we know, hadn't really been tried yet, where we would have each building actually have its time, um, its development time attached to it, and then in Navisworks, we could do a 4D model showing buildings coming in over time. I think there's like a spurt in the late 90s where a bunch of stuff comes up. the stadium, that was a milestone. This was done in 2008, so. Oh, another little uh, fun tool that um, having a city model also allowed us to do for the client. When they were looking at multiple alternatives for the viaduct, 
We did several different types of uh, displays on, um, on a web portal showing different alternatives. And this one we called an alternatives matrix where you had a different viewpoint and then you could cycle through different alternatives. It's subtle, but you're seeing different versions of the waterfront development, which is part of the tunnel option. And then you see a couple of different alternatives for an elevated um, alternative. And the, the matrix is complete. Each viewpoint has all the different alternatives. And these types of uh, displays were put out on the web and people were able to uh, look at them. And at one point there was even a, a voting option for different alternatives. And then one of the more fun models um, that we produced, the client, once the tunnel option had been selected, the client said, well, what about stuff underground? Can you build us a data set of everything that's underneath the city that uh, you know, affects or is adjacent to this tunnel corridor? So we use Sanborn maps, which are real estate maps, which show you kind of how deep the understories, how many stories there are underground for a lot of buildings and how high some of those uh, uh, building uh, basements are. And then we had as-built piles information for the seawall, the existing structure, and some of the other elements amount, uh, around it. So we call it our worm's eye view of the, the corridor. And again, it's all in the same coordinate system. Everything's based in the same model space. Another project where we've been able to invest a lot of time and um, um, effort into a context model, it's even bigger than a city model, is the Bay Area. There are three or four projects that we've worked on in the Bay Area, and we've kind of overlapped, been able to overlap efforts on this model for the different projects. One is the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, which uh, crosses the bay between San Francisco and Oakland. Another is the Presidio Parkway, which is uh, up by the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, the main motivation for the selection of the suspension style for this bridge was the idea that it would fit in context with the other suspension bridges in the Bay Area. And so we were challenged by the client to show how that would work. You know, we tried photo sims, we tried other things, but ultimately it, it was um, a 3D model was the best way to show it in context. And of course, we did all the usual fly-throughs and drive-overs and um, other types of, of animations, which were all that much better um, at showing the project because it could be done in context. And again, to talk about how these are made, it's, it's primarily the base is a terrain model from USGS and some city data. Aerial photographs, um, as current as we can get. A lot of uh, GIS data for buildings. And then in the major city areas, we would come in and build custom buildings uh, if we couldn't find it from some of the vendors like Cyber City 3D. Chuck mentioned there's a company in San Francisco, used to be called ScreenPoint, now Steel Blue. They had a pretty good model of San Francisco. Um, just a lot of a hodgepodge of different things. We just had to come up with a workflow to get them all into the same workspace as the rest of the models. I mentioned Presidio Parkway as well. This is a project that's in a national park um, in the city of San Francisco, very controversial. There's no way the public involvement program could have moved forward without being able to show how this project fit into the context of the city. So again, these city models are critical for, for moving these projects forward. In this case, most of the terrain was very detailed. We had project terrain data coming out of the design files for the project. The corridor is built from design models for the project. Uh, this was a hodgepodge of uh, Casey moved into inroads uh, or Civil 3D to build the proposed surfaces and then uh, geospatial data for the park and uh, buildings. And then again, all the buildings are custom textured, mostly in 3D Studio Max. Sometimes the project is the city itself. In this case, the project was a street that was being redesigned to be an entertainment corridor in the city of Denver. And really a lot of the landscaping, a lot of the hardscape along 14th Street was being developed by building type or to accommodate different building types. So again, you really couldn't show this street redesign without showing the buildings around it. And you'll see here that as you move away from the corridor, the detail in the buildings drops off. Another point that I usually make with these models is level of detail is really relative to how close you need to be to your views, and which is driven by how close you are to the project itself. You can have low-res buildings in the distance and high-res buildings in the foreground. 
And the theme here was the, the street through the seasons, since we get a lot of seasons on a weekly basis in Denver. <laughs> Uh, we also have started working on a, a model of Los Angeles primarily to accommodate a couple of uh, transit projects we're working on there. In this case, the, how the underground corridor related to specific buildings on the surface was really important to show. In downtown LA, there's obviously a lot of very recognizable, significant buildings. And so the, the purpose of this to, was to show where the stations were, where the vertical access was going to be. I mean, there's a whole, also a whole map sort of use of the model here where we're showing where the corridors are relative to buildings which once you have the model it can serve that sort of informational purpose as well. I'm going to zoom ahead here to show the fly through along the corridor. So that shows where each of the stations is. Then we zoom down and we're going to show the corridor underneath the city. Now, and everybody who works here kind of recognizes their building where the streets are. So this is the project called the Regional Connector, which is just an underground corridor in the heart of downtown connecting two existing lines together. And for this model, we actually were able to start with a model from Cyber City 3D. So we have most of the city at one level of detail, we went in and retextured a lot of the buildings along the corridor to give us a higher level of detail. We have terrain models, again, from US, USGS and aerial photos, which we usually end up cleaning up and, and retiling for our specific models. We also, were, excuse me, we also worked on a project called Sixth Street Bridge in LA. And the main focus of this bridge, this uh, Jesse mentioned it earlier, it's a, a bridge that you've seen in many films and maybe didn't know it. But it's, uh, it's a family of bridges. There are several of these along the LA River, which is just adjacent to downtown. And so the story was how these bridges fit in the context of the city, and in particular, how this bridge fits in you know, with views to the downtown as you're driving across the bridge. So again, there was probably no way we could have communicated the story of this bridge without having the entire city modeled. Yeah, we didn't win this, though. <laughs> but we didn't design the bridge. We just rendered uh, images of it. <laughs> I just want to play it through enough. There's a nice sequence where you actually see the bridge in the context of the downtown. And of course, as machines get better and the software gets better, we're able to model and render bigger and bigger areas and models till pretty soon there is no real limitation. We call it brute force. You just throw everything in the model and wait for it to render. The last uh, city I was gonna talk about, uh, we also have a project in Connecticut, the New Haven Harbor Crossing. This is a project where we had two goals we were working in parallel with. One was to do visualization to communicate the project to the public. The other was a, a Navisworks 40 model that we were managing as the, pro, um, the project progressed. And so this is, a, again, something we try to do and, and is easy because we've kept everything in a consistent coordinate system. We can carry a Navisworks model forward, which includes all the context, as well as our MAX model, which we use for visualization. And we can use the 4D model to inform the visualization model. So as the project progresses, we can take snapshots out of our Navisworks 4D models that show us how the project is going to look in the visualization model. So here you're seeing a Navisworks schedule link model, kind of a classic 4D model. It's certainly one of the largest ones we've worked on. This is uh, Highway 95. It crosses over Highway 1. It's got two other interstates converging. So a very complicated interchange pro uh, project with a lot of traffic switches and closures. So the blue lines you're seeing represent active lanes of traffic. So this kind of had a, a slightly different purpose in communication. 
we needed to show the local stakeholders how traffic was going to progress, how traffic switches would occur. And again, having the context that it sits in made it that much easier to communicate what was going on. If it was, a, if it was just a bridge sitting in space, it would have been much harder to explain where things were. I think this is a detailed shot of the same thing. Again, the, um, it's sort of a classic model with green for construction, red for demolition, but in this case, again, the blue lines represent an active lane of traffic. And for instance, you'll see a temporary ramp here come online partway through the simulation. And when everybody looks here and they can recognize the building they're in and where this model is sitting and what the orientation is because we have this city model around the, the simulation. And that drove a lot of visualization that we did both for the, the local stakeholders as well as the community. You know, there's going to be a major construction activity happening over the weekend and it's uh, causing a closure. So, you know, we learned with a lot of other projects that showing people what you're going to do, why you're closing the roadway, they embrace the project and I think they listen a little bit better. They understand why there's a closure and they stay away from the project on the weekend that you're, you're doing your closure. So we did a lot of renderings showing complicated lift sequences. We did renderings in the city model again showing traffic stages. Here's a shift. There's several colors, but um, basically the yellow shows where traffic is before and then after the shift. And even the, the local CH or whatever con uh, Connecticut State Patrol is started um, requiring regular meetings and we had to bring these graphics in and show them to them so they understood why the closure was happening, where they needed to do um, traffic maintenance. And we also did little drive-throughs showing people what it was going to look like before the shift and after the shift in context. So if you were used to a certain drive on Monday morning, you know, the next Monday after this shift, it was going to be completely different. And so people could go online and look and, oh, I'm going to have to be on the other side of the freeway when I exit after this shift. And there were 16 major shifts for which we did these um, sets of visuals, uh, both 4D models showing what was happening to the construction planning team, and then visualizations for the public and stakeholders showing what it was going to look like before and after. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about real time. We've, we've shown several real time models, but one of the things that made that much easier to do are a lot of automated game development tools that exist out there. Our visualization models are usually built and designed to produce high end visualization renderings, but there are a lot of tools now that were developed by the gaming industry that allows you to convert those to optimize geometry and to bake textures, create a single texture for a single building so you have a more uh, optimized packaged model that you bring into your real-time environment. And interestingly, that real-time environment could be a, a city engine type of environment. Navisworks benefits by this workflow. Uh, we've also explored a couple of gaming engines, one of which is uh, the Unreal Engine, UDK, which has a lot of those issues that Chuck talked about from a proprietary standpoint. We have to have a splash screen for the vendor on it, which our clients don't like necessarily. Um, and it has its own restrictions and limitations on building models, but it's a great engine for real-time models. Uh, this is a model of the Corniche in Doha, the roadway along the waterfront. Um, and this is all being rendered out of a real-time model. We just recorded it. But we built these to run a simulator that people could drive, showing the views along the Corniche with proposed development over time. So here you're seeing uh, an output from the simulator stream, and then I think there's a little short video clip of somebody driving in this exotic uh, uh, display. This was actually this thing they call the Emperor Chair, was designed to be an office workstation. We just adapted it by putting a steering wheel on it uh, and turned it into our simulator. The last model I want to talk about is um, something more akin to what Chuck's been showing. Um, we've been exploring using InfraWorks as a, an environment for building some of these big context models for our projects. Um, what I like about InfraWorks in particular is it does have a very nice front end uh, way of bringing in geospatial information. It loads aerials, it loads terrain, it loads shape files, um, and you know, can read the, the coordinate system, and it's actually, it runs pretty smoothly with pretty big models. 
So our first uh, large scale project we tried using it for was our San Francisco model. So we brought in the entire Bay Area as well as the uh, proposed Bay Bridge project. Um, we brought in our texture map downtown model. So most of the downtown is covered by fully textured building, uh, buildings. We use the city's street, uh, excuse me, the city's landscaping layer, a shape file which had a dot for every tree downtown. So each of the, all the palm trees along the waterfront are sitting in a location coming from the city's database. Uh, we had the street grid in there, but we didn't like the way the street grid looked using their tools. We liked it better as a texture map, but you know you could switch between those two depending on what you're trying to do with the model. You can render views from the bridge showing what kind of views you would have of the, the city from the new bridge, as well as the Presidio Parkway project. So we had these two very large 3D project models um, running in the, in the model at the same time. The other thing that these models uh, allow you to do, because everything's operating in a fixed coordinate system, Chuck mentioned the access to laser scan data. Uh, we're working on a project on Market Street where we want to understand the cable system for the streetcars. And I think Autodesk worked with a vendor to get this scan of Market Street. And we're, this, this has been brought into the InfraWorks model. And this little animation is a spin around done inside InfraWorks. So you can mix these different types of data all in one uh, consistent integrated environment. <clears throat> it's a geospatial database. It does a lot of interesting things that geospatial uh, tools use. This was just something we did to try it out. This is a five meter and a 10 meter um, coloration showing potential water rise in the city of San Francisco. And you can see not only you know, on the aerial what properties might be affected, but also buildings that sit on those different places. And this particular image is the city's building data set. They have a data set which has building heights associated with it. And InfraWorks allows you to extrude those uh, shapes automatically based on the building height. Um, I was going to run the model really quick just to try it out bravely trying a, a demo like Chuck did, but I just wanted to touch upon a few points that I think are critical when you try to do these models, even more so now with these more geospatially driven models. You know, define your referencing right up front. If your project's in state plane, we typically, if we're gonna work primarily on a project, we work with everything in state plane. But if you're going in and out of something like InfraWorks, sometimes you might go to geographic uh, systems or a UTM we're seeing a lot, especially in Canada. Um, start with available data. The first thing we will do is go out to National Map or something like that and pull down whatever's free so we have a, a context with a rich aerial and nice terrain uh, and we can build a simple model really quickly. Uh, it's got to be, you have to understand the quality of your data. The big issue we had with, with Google Earth was you never knew who built that model and what they used as a source. It could have been you know, ridiculous, and yet there are people out there doing shadow studies with models they pulled down from Google Earth. You know, and build the detail based on your deliverable. It's going to evolve over time. You can't start off by building the whole model at the highest level of detail. You have to sort of have a plan on where detail needs to be. So let me, uh, nope, I didn't leave it running, so. I'm just going to load up that San Francisco model so you can see, you know, it is a real-time environment. It's got some nice capabilities, and it's a, it's a large model. So I think we're going to see this evolution from all the different vendors. You know, these tools are going to, going to grow in performance capability, linkages to external data, access to mobile devices. I brought my wrong mobile device, but I can export this model and run it on my iPad if I want to. Um, so this is, as I said, this is the San Francisco area database. It's got terrain for that entire region you're looking at. It has the entire city and property owned by the city uh, with shape files that are being extruded to building height. And then downtown, it's got nice detailed texture map buildings. And then it's got our model of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, New East Span in place here. And I can almost navigate smoothly in it here, but you can get down and see the, the detail we've got on our 3D model of the bridge. And then as I said, we've also got uh, Presidio Parkway in here. So the good news, one sense is 
again, it's not just one vendor that's providing this type of capability. It's multiple vendors uh, are doing this. And uh, Kevin's navigating in real time in a pretty massive model as well. So again, as time continues to progress, these large scale databases will become even more uh, accessible and, and easier to use and function within as well. As just a shot down Market Street, we've also been looking at using this to um, evaluate some designs for the redevelopment of Market Street. I had a plan, but I don't have it in this particular model. Yep, well that was all I wanted to show. If I could, I think I even showed my last slide. Yep. Thank you. use this for questions yeah if anybody has any additional questions we'd love to answer them we we'll probably have two or three minutes and then we got to move out of the way for the actually there's, a there's actually a large yeah, break in the yeah. exhibit hall I think for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour or something if you want to come up and try driving one of these you're welcome to come up uh, feel free I got it. so in a big firm like you how many city models do you have and how do you manage sharing with them that's something <laughs> We don't share them with anybody. <laughs> Data sharing. Data sharing. Well, yeah, that is a challenge, this whole notion of the cloud. Even within our, within our company, we have different servers at each major regional location. Luckily, we, in Denver, the, the entire corporate colo sits near our office, so we have access to everybody's data. But sharing it locally is a big challenge. Um, you, know, you can't just copy these files. That's a, I think that San Francisco model is now something like a... I want to say 50 gigs or something like that. So a copy takes a few hours. You know, they do have some cloud-based tools that they're trying to implement. I think I agree with Chuck that that really re depends more on your internal <laughs> hardware than it does on the cloud, and we're just not there yet. Our company, you know, our machines and bandwidth don't really support sharing that model through the cloud. So it's a put it on a drive and send it to the client. That's kind of still... We're back to that overnight delivery thing where I finish it today, the client's not going to see it till tomorrow. <laughs> That's great stuff, great models. Yeah, for a digital product, how much will it cost to increase it? See, that's hard because we don't really bid on doing one of these models. They, they grow kind of organically, you know, by project. Seattle grew over 15 years. San Francisco, we did make a concerted effort to rebuild it for InfraWorks, and that I think that was something like uh, you know a thousand hours or something to to rebuild it to make it real timeable and current and add some projects in. So it, it's a bit of work. It's not automated. You know, a lot of it is the aerials, the terrain, the base model volumes can be automated. But you know, I know Chuck said his seven spices. That's not only there because of the limitations in the software, but I think in order to optimize it, as you would a game or something else, there's a certain level of effort there. And the more you spend on it, the more time you spend on it, the more optimized it becomes. Tomorrow we're doing a, a session, and we'll get into a little more detail on how some of these things are created. Uh, we've kind of broad brushed today more from a 10,000-foot level, but tomorrow we'll get in much more detail on how we create these models uh, as well. It, it's a level of detail is your number one issue on how much. If you, for example, you want a one square kilometer site of all the buildings in your city, but they can be based off their aerial imagery and they can be mass modeled, and I can tell you for under three grand, I can do that for you. If you want them all detailed to um, high level, now we're talking, you know, anywhere from fifty to hundred thousand dollars to do the same location maybe even more it just depends on your level of detail um, I actually have a modeling guide that I distribute to my clients and it has four levels of detail for buildings and structures and for terrain and it allows them to pick and choose how much detail and it's a database decide up front how much you want to do uh, and Kevin's totally right uh, you can't do everything up front. So usually I tell my clients, let's do the outer area in low resolution, but accurate, and focus on the area that we need. You get that started, and then maybe two years down the road, you can repurpose it 
as Kevin had done with his Presidio model in San Francisco. Yeah, there are vendors out there that have prices per square mile, uh, square kilometer. I want to say pictometry right now is yeah. 5K per square kilometer or something. Yeah, PLW but, Model Works is another yeah. firm as well. Cyber City 3D. Well, it always depends on the contract. You can get through the, the city, but um, typically we provide them renderings and animations. We don't provide models. So the way we, we actually have language in our contract that says we retain ownership of certain types of assets, and typically we maintain that we own the model. The city owns anything we produce from it. But if they give us data to put in our model, then it's usually a partnership or a sharing agreement. But we always try to get language that says we can reuse the model for other projects. Because really the model is only valuable if we can work with the city, but also work with a developer and work with a transit agency. You know, they can't work together, so <laughs> we'd never be able to get them to use it that way, I don't think. How many models of New York City do you think are out there? <laughs> well, funny, the one that you saw, there's a site called, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name, but we paid 300 bucks for most of New York. The area, and it was all texture mapped. But the core, ma the midtown, we got from the, we worked with the city to convert there because they had a really detailed model that they did for uh, communications for line of sight amongst buildings. So for the shadow study, we had a pretty tight model. I, I, there's hundreds out there. Every right. firm, I'll bet these guys have one. Uh, <laughs> HDR has one. I know Autodesk. I'm not sure how many cities they're up to now, but. I think they have 14 or 16 U.S. cities done right now, and I think as their InfraWorks product matures, they're going to be selling you those models so that you don't have to build them. You can just get them, and we're not talking a lot. I've heard figures two to four hundred dollars per square kilometer, so the cost will be relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Well, when you get models built by these other companies or something, do you put it language in there for the locals to know? Yes. Uh, if you like go to three hundred dollar model, I'm sure is not that accurate. Again, Autodesk is going on quantity. They, they're going to say you and fifty thousand other people are going to buy it. So yeah, it's two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars a square kilometer for an accurate three D model. Of, of it's not section. textured though. That's not textured, textured, but model. it's an accurate three yeah. D model. Uh, if Cyber City three D, if you go to their site, they have also four levels of fidelity that they offer on their models. Maybe you don't have to be incredibly accurate. You're just doing a baseline GIS app, and that's relatively inexpensive. Uh, don't hold me to this, but I think you can get a square kilometer for like $2,400 from Cyber City. So if you're doing a huge city, that's, of course, that's a lot of money when you add it up, but per kilometer, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, we bought the LA model textured for, I think it was 20 no, it was more than 2,500. Was it? Yeah, it was a lot more than that. <laughs> doesn't, just, doesn't the Esri City Engine give you some tools to help with doing the, uh, the texturing? Yeah. And, and footprinting and procedural building? That's the exciting part. Uh, City Engine is procedural. They, Esri bought them. And, and what you can do with the rules is you can auto texture um, buildings. Um, quite rapidly. You can build cities with your rules if you have excellent rules. Uh, for the city's master plan, we took all of their zoning and permitting for their master plan, which includes things such as setback, building height, uh, window area, materials, and we wrote the rules and then we built their entire master plan off the rules and that took the computer an hour and a half to crunch that out. And it, it was done and the models look really nice, and they're, they're based on all of those rules. And, and I think that truly will be what happens with uh, Autodesk and Bentley in the future, that those, those things will be generated based off rules versus you sitting there doing them. So when doing that, though, you may not get the exact building um, texture. Correct. Uh, I mean, the, what's happened so far for the cities we've done stuff where we, we import their rules and then they look at the buildings and they don't like them. And I tell them you need to change your zoning or the materials that you're requiring. 
Uh, most cities have zones. If I pick on a downtown area, you have a towers district, you have a commercial district, residential, and each district has specific rules that must be adhered to and different textures as well. And every time we run them, they don't like them. And I usually tell them you gotta change your zoning. <laughs> well, that's why they hire architects, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what they really like is the idea, of, and we haven't, and I, I, this is where I need help from Esri because uh, it hasn't been developed yet. I, I really do want to take a Revit model and dump it into City Engine and have City Engine gut check it. Tell me, did they adhere to the setbacks? Did they adhere to the right textures? Um, to me, that saves so much money and time for the city. It also helps improve the uh, approval process for the developer so he can move forward. Um, but it protects the city. They, a lot of clients that I talk to, they feel like they've been a little uh, misled. They see a sexy animation or renderings and they think that's what it's gonna look like. And in reality, it, usually not the case and in, in, in city engine they can go and see that building from wherever they need to see it from with those rules applied so I'm, I'm excited about that but again we're still new city engines only been out really for a year and it, it needs a lot of work T Terry's not here now so I can <laughs> but but we're, we're highly interested in it but I'll be honest with you as well we're still looking at InfraWorks which is really the competitor to in a way to city engine and I like competition. You got Autodesk and Esri pushing the limits. It will be the winners of, of that one. And then Google will probably buy one or both of them anyway. Is, is InfoWorks, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is InfoWorks uh, a product that was developed in, by Leeds University called Dynamite? No, Dynamite's a, if I'm not mistaken, that was a product that ran with a Bentley tool and there were some plugins for Max and stuff that would do some roadway generation stuff. No, I believe Autodesk, Craig left, but I believe Autodesk uh, developed with some technology from an acquisition, they developed InfoWorks internally. Right. InfoWorks great if you're an Autodesk shop. If you use other products, AKA Bentley or Esri, then InfoWorks is not such a seamless product yet. And that I hope to see change. And the same holds true for City Engine. You know, there's limitations as far as importing. If Pat had brought up how do we share data. Those issues need to be worked out. And uh, I think the more people that are using these products, the more push back on the vendors to improve them. If that's it, go enjoy. There's probably some fantastic cookies out there. <laughs> If you want to come up and play, please do.